self custody of Bitcoin is a critical part of it's a critical benefit of the Bitcoin network, but it's also critical to the systemic security of the network. So when you have a lot of different people self custodying a lot of Bitcoin, that gives a uh, the network an additional layer of robustness in terms of having that Bitcoin be protected. Whereas if everybody's keeping their Bitcoin in a few exchanges held by a few custodians, that puts the Bitcoin network itself at risk because somebody, a bad actor, or even just making a mistake could freeze all of that Bitcoin, cause it to be handed over to a government or something, or, you know, steal it. And so in that scenario, if 50% of the Bitcoin networks, like the actual Bitcoin in the world, were to suddenly be seized, what does that do to the usability of Bitcoin overall as a currency? I think it's harmful. And so today there's estimates that say legitimately up to 60% potentially of all outstanding Bitcoin is held by a custodian. So one of the things that, that really 60%, that's, that's yeah, a lot. 60%. That was an, um, an estimate by Chainalysis mm -hmm. who you know, they've got insight into what all the custodians are doing, what all the wallets are doing. You know, they're kind of the evil overlords of blockchain analysis, <laughs> right? But they have a pretty good view of what's going on. Right. And they put out a blog post that was actually, you know, the analysis was done a couple of years ago. So um, I, but I don't think based on the data that it's gotten much better, uh -huh. that about 60% of total Bitcoin that isn't lost is um, held by custodians today. So when I zoom out, I think that's a risk to the network. And I've been telling people this for a while now, and this is why it's a big part of Costa's mission is we have to get as many people as possible self custodying their Bitcoin because it is critical for the health of Bitcoin, but also for the people who are holding it because it just gives them so much more security, sovereignty, and the the freedom that Bitcoin offers, you only get that when you are holding your own keys. So helping people to get started with that is critical, helping them move off of exchanges, start holding their own keys. And Casa is a great place to do that because we have solutions for all different levels of holdings. And we've tried to make it super simple for people to do no matter where you are. So um, that is, I think, the big picture trend that I'm really focused on today yeah. and that I think is important for us to be Valid talking point. about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Welcome to the show. Nick Neumann, CEO of Casa. Thanks so much for your time coming on my show. Um, how are you doing, man? Great. Thank you for having me, Kayvon. I'm, I'm excited to come on and talk to you a bit. I know you've been uh, either a customer or friends with Casa for a long time now. Uh, I was I was looking back through some of my emails and found emails from you like three years ago. So, uh, which is pretty crazy. So, yeah, I'm excited to finally be able to uh, be on the podcast and have a conversation. Yeah, definitely, my pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I, you know, really talked to someone from from Cause. I think the last time was uh, Jameson Lop. Uh, yeah. To be honest, I, I don't know. Is he still with Casa or is he security? Yeah, he is. Jam yeah. Jameson's our CTO. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Is his all the content he puts out? Also, you know, when it comes to security, I mean, he's like super paranoid, but but extremely. I mean, uh, depth. Uh, you know, so much, so much uh, depth, and when it comes to content and 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 understanding. So um, let's let's recapitulate a little bit, Nick. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe we can recapitulate a little bit. Uh, what what is Casa? Uh, what was what was the original idea? Who was it? F who was it designed for or developed for? What was like the inspiration? That would like be really interesting, maybe. Sure. So, Casa was started because uh, a few of us separately realized the really massive problem around securing Bitcoin, especially in self custody, and so there was. You know, a couple of us, including me, Jameson, and then um, one of our other co-founders who's not with the company anymore, Jeremy, and 
each kind of separately, we had these ideas around how to make self-custody and managing private keys better. And then through a whole long kind of journey of randomness and coincidence, we ended up kind of getting together and, and creating CASA back in 2018. And the really the core problem that we are solving is that self-custody is critical to the health and success of Bitcoin as a whole. But it's something that people aren't familiar with. It feels uncomfortable. It's easy for people to make mistakes. And so they don't, um, you know, they either don't participate in it at all and they just decide to leave their, their coins on an exchange or they uh, try it, make a mistake and, you know, then they've lost money and they have this kind of bad feeling about self-custody generally. And it just, it provides, it creates a lot of anxiety for people. So we wanted to create a product that made it almost foolproof to hold your own keys and to self-custody your Bitcoin, um, made it super simple, added in a whole layer of service that really nobody else in the industry was doing at the time to help people with this. And that really was the, the core. It was that UX security and service. Those three elements were the core of, of what CASA would grow out of. And so um, that was started back in 2018. And it's been a few years now and we've grown substantially from where we were. And, but the, the core mission continues to be the same, which is to help people achieve their personal sovereignty through the use of private keys. Um, so Nick, I'm really curious, like what kind of people, who are your customers? I mean, uh, if, if, can you like, uh, is there, can you dissect it? Like, like what kind of people are these who are, uh, you know, really eager to, to become Casa customers, so young or older sure. people are like migrating or not? Yeah. So it, this is really interesting because it's evolved a lot over the last few years, but if you look at when we first started, so it, it, any um, successful startup picks a very niche customer to start with, right? Because you want to really nail it for that initial customer from an experience and product perspective, and then grow out from there. And so Casa's first customer that we focused on, that we really nailed it with, were people who held a large amount of Bitcoin. So it, basically anybody holding more than 100,000 US dollars worth of Bitcoin. And the reason for this was because they had the most value to protect and they were also the most underserved out of any customer in the market because you can't just really trust a normal Coinbase account to hold you know, multiple hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. The security level just isn't high enough. And then, in addition to that, or, or on the flip side, just putting it on a ledger really didn't feel good for people. You know, they've got this single device that is sitting somewhere in their house, or maybe it's a bank deposit box or something like that. And if anything happens to that, they've lost a significant amount of wealth. And so that was really the first place that we started focusing. And we built out our three of five multi-sig product, which basically means that you have, instead of just that one single key on that one ledger protecting your funds. You've got five keys protecting your funds and you only need three of them to actually access them. And we can go in more into that model later, but basically at, at a high level, what that lets people do is they can make a mistake and accidentally lose one or even two of their keys at the same time. It gives them additional protection against um, in-person attackers or hackers, it, basically the theft side of things. And so that gave that customer persona a ton of peace of mind around the security of their Bitcoin. So that was where we started. And actually, we've continued to grow that core product offering a lot or since 2018. You know, And um, so we still help a lot of people today who are in that kind of situation, who are coming off of a Coinbase account for the first time. And they had $2 million worth of Bitcoin sitting on Coinbase and they now they're moving off because they feel comfortable enough to work with Casa. So um, that was really the, the first customer that we started with. And then we've grown out from there to support a lot more different types of customers. And it, this is where it gets really interesting because you ask, you know, 
what is the persona or what's kind of their age range or their life circumstance. And it is all over the board. And that's one of the really cool things I think about Bitcoin and self-custody generally is that we've got people who are, you know, the young tech person in who's 25, who is uh, wanting to hold their own keys. We've also got the 70 year old war vet who got into Bitcoin and wants to hold their own keys and everybody in between. And so we get to see and help such a broad range of people to secure their Bitcoin, to have that full control of self-custody without all of that anxiety that comes with just having something on a ledger or a treasure. And that's been really cool to see. Great. Um, so, you know, I talked to Rodolfo from um, CoinKite, you know, Cold Call Wallet, and, uh, which, you know, of course, I'm also a big, big fan of it. Um, yeah. So, and you can use Cold Card with Casa. So that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's great. Uh, so, um, we talked about like decoy and plausible deniability. That was a really fascinating discussion we had. So, um, is that something like a topic that comes up, like decoy plus? Because you know, you talked about like theft or in person attack, like, mm -hmm. you know, especially when people are like traveling, maybe, or um, they want to, you know, have this feeling of security that or uh, also redundancy and, and, and sort of a backup plan and, and a plausible deniability. Is that like these are these topics, are these themes that are important with Casa customers? Yeah, so we take some various approaches to building security up. There's no one silver bullet for Casa customers that protects you against everything, right? So you, yeah, you want all these different layers um, because in the end, the, the name of the game for protecting against something like theft is to make yourself a harder target than the average person, basically. Like it's, it's kind of like, you don't want to be the easiest house on the block to rob kind of thing. And so, um, there, the way that we handle security, um, and help prevent thefts is like I mentioned earlier, instead of just having one key, you've got multiple keys protecting one pool of Bitcoin, right? Well, what people do is they actually distribute each of those keys, which is on you know their phone or a hardware device, or one is held by Casa, and they put them in different locations. So this means that even if somebody shows up to your house or you're traveling and they you know grab you and try to mug you or whatever and try to get you to send them your Bitcoin, you this isn't even plausible deniability. You can say truthfully, I cannot move this Bitcoin and send it to you unless you're going to kidnap me and take me around to all of the different locations where my keys are held. And in that scenario, you know, that's just too high of a bar for the vast majority of thieves. And so that protection, you know, we think is even better than something like a decoy wallet. A decoy wallet can be used in addition to this, but the core kind of multiple key security model is the best you can get to protect against theft because it makes it actually impossible for you to move funds unless you were to travel to all those different geographic locations. With a decoy wallet, you know, there's a couple of um, potential flaws with this approach to security. So one is, what if you don't remember the password to that special decoy wallet when somebody's holding a gun to your head? Or two, if this person is more of a targeted attacker, so they researched you and they know that you ha you should have more than half a Bitcoin or whatever you put in that decoy wallet, who's to say that they stop after you, after you give them the money out of the decoy wallet, right? And so there are some uh, more permutations, I think, to the ways that decoy wallets and plausible deniability can go to where you don't want that to be your only solution. So that's that's totally fine to have that as part of the solution, but the core security solution we really believe should be multi-sig where you've got multiple keys geographically distributed. It just makes you significantly more resilient to things like theft and loss. Okay, so that's great. So uh, first of all, um, I mean, can you say like, um, what is like the, the standard, not the standard, but like the, 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 the most selected like, um, you know, uh, setup like is it two out of three or three out of five or uh, 
is, is we have a range of customers across both i mean okay. it's and you know it's it's logical that we have more customers using the two out of three than we do the three out of five and that's because the three out of five is more expensive so it only makes sense if you are holding more bitcoin and at certain levels of bitcoin holdings you don't need that three out of five security the two out of three is enough so you should always be thinking about what is my threat model jameson talks about this a lot what is my threat model you know if you're holding two thousand dollars worth of bitcoin your threat model is much different than somebody holding five hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoin and so we have you know more customers at that two of three level but that's not to say that you know at the three of five level you know there's like we don't have anybody or something we we do that is really our bread and butter from a uh, company product perspective but what we've really tried to do is build so we started with that three of five model and we really wanted to as a company make it easy for anybody no matter what how much bitcoin they hold to be holding their own keys and to do that in a way that they don't have to worry about losing those keys so that three of five model is the top one the two of three which you uh, mentioned is a key on your phone a key on a hardware wallet and a key held by casa so that means if you're already using a hardware wallet like a ledger or something or trezor to secure your bitcoin it's really a no-brainer to use the casa two out of three it's 10 bucks a month but then it um you, you don't have any more devices to manage so you all you're doing is using the same hardware wallet that you already have, and you're adding through Casa software, a key on your phone, you already have that phone, and then one key held by Casa. So no additional devices to manage, but then what it means is, let's say uh, you lose that hardware wallet. Well, you don't have to worry about that because you had the key on your phone and the key held by Casa still helping you protect and access your funds. You swap out that hardware wallet for a new one, and suddenly you're back in the game and you, you're back to full security. So then we go down from there to just a really simple key on your phone. Feels like, and it's a single signature wallet. It's great for people getting started in Bitcoin or great for keeping small amounts that you want to be able to send more easily. And it feels like you're using Coinbase. You don't have to worry about writing down a seed phrase because it's encrypted and backed up to the cloud automatically for you. It takes you know, literally a minute to get started, you create your account and boom, the wallet's on your device. So we've really tried to make that simple. And the idea there is let's help everybody who today is getting started on an exchange because they don't know where else to go, get started with holding their own keys in the first place. And then they can graduate from there to using a hardware wallet, using multi-sig as the value that they're holding grows. Yeah, sounds fantastic. So, uh, Nick, so one of the keys is uh, with whatever two out of three, three out of five, but one of the keys is Casa, uh, with Casa. So, yeah, yeah. is that like um, you get often that question or like sort of a frequently asked question, like what happens to you know what happens to Casa? What what if what if it goes bust? Which is of course you know extremely unlikely, unrealistic. But do, yeah. do people ask that? Like what what? what yeah, we get company? asked that all the time. And what do you so, what do you say? So here's one of the major benefits of the CASA model is that CASA was built to protect against single points of failure. And that includes CASA ourselves as a single point of failure. We want to make it so that there, you never have to worry about CASA being a uh, blocker in terms of you being able to access your Bitcoin. So to start with, we've got one key out of the three or out of the five. That one key by itself cannot be used to move any Bitcoin and you don't need it to move any Bitcoin. You can move Bitcoin without ever interacting with that CASA key, as long as you have your other keys still available. So then because we use the core Bitcoin protocol multi-sig, that means that it's interoperable with other multi-sig wallets. So that's like Spectre wallet, Electrum wallet, um, Sparrow, you know, there's a few others that are basically yeah. like open source wallets. Yeah. You can take, there's, a, there's a, a kit you can actually export from within CASA. It's called the Sovereign Recovery Kit. You can export that and it has all of the detail you need to basically plug your keys into one of these other apps that CASA doesn't even run and fully 
recreate your multi-sig and access your Bitcoin. So that's really important to us because like you said, it's very unlikely that Casa is just going to disappear overnight. But in case anything were to happen, we want to make sure like our, our goal is our mission is empowering people with their personal sovereignty, right? Well, that is kind of ruined if they can't access their Bitcoin without Casa. And so that's really the, uh, one of the main benefits of, of our model versus using a custodian. Like if you're using a custodian, which is like an exchange or, you know, somebody else holding all of the keys to your Bitcoin for you, if they go away, there's a good right. chance you're not getting your Bitcoin back. Makes so sense, it's, yeah. it's a big yeah. benefit. What about the seed for it? Because I remember was it, it was cause yeah, it was cause in the beginning. They said you don't need to, you know, sort of uh, save your seed phrase. And then I think you changed that 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 advice or you, you somehow uh, it, uh, is that true or so the, the advice is the same, which is you don't need to save your seed phrase. Uh -huh. And here's the reason for this. Um, uh, well, just for the put, listeners, I mean the seed phrase of the hardware wallet, right? So, right, of the of the private keys that are part yeah, of your cost exactly, setup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what we say is you don't need to save your seed phrase, but the keys are yours. So if you feel more comfortable saving your seed phrase, go for it, right? It's your decision. That said, with the CASA model, you don't need to save it. And, and here's why. Seed phrases were originally invented because people only had one key. Nobody was really using multi-sig at that point in time. And so when you had only that one key, you had to make sure that if you lost that key, you could recreate it or else you lost all of your funds, right? And so this was essentially a backup that was a human readable backup of the private key. Well, it turns out people aren't really very used to actually writing down a 24 word phrase on a piece of paper. They can't put it in a password manager or any online connected device. They've got to put it somewhere safe where nobody else can find it. It's really a user experience that people aren't familiar with and it causes a lot of anxiety. And we think it actually causes people, it causes enough friction for people to decide not to self-custody. So with the CASA model, because you don't have to worry about recreating one key, you don't need the seed phrase anymore. So you lose a key instead of doing everything you can to recreate that key, you just replace it with a new one and you use the other keys in your multi-key setup to recover access to your funds. So that means you have fewer things to secure, like physical things like that seed phrase paper to secure. And it also means that you, you know, this makes it easier for the average person to access and use private keys and self-custody as a technology. The other thing, which is something that a, a lot of people, I think they don't think about this when they're setting up their private keys and, and writing down their seed phrase, but it's a pretty interesting security angle, which is that your seed phrase, because it's human readable, is an unencrypt, a fully unencrypted form of your private key. So somebody can find that piece of paper, copy it down because it's unencrypted, and then put it back wherever they found it. And then you have no idea that that key is compromised. And that's one of the risk vectors of a seed phrase that a lot of people don't take into account. And so one of our customers, uh, there's actually, he was talking about this on a YouTube uh, video on another podcast uh, a few months ago, had his home robbed. His seed phrase was sitting on his desk and it was the seed phrase to the ledger that was part of his CASA setup. If he wasn't using CASA, then they would have been able to get all of the Bitcoin off of that ledger right then and there with that seed phrase. Luckily, because he was using CASA, that key was compromised and he was able to swap it out, but they weren't able to get any funds because he had the other two keys in his two of three setup protecting his Bitcoin. But when you're just, you know, using a seed phrase with a normal single sig wallet, that theft option or that theft uh, attack vector is mm -hmm. a real one. Oh, that's great. Okay. So this is true, like security redundancy or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, 
do people like do your customers ask about privacy? I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's nonsensical, but but do they ask you like what about you know does Casa know about whatever the amount of funds or you know what goes in, what goes out? Um, yeah, so people ask about this, and we just tell them the truth, which is this: Casa, the because we are a self custody wallet provider, we don't need to KYC you. So you can actually sign up with a completely pseudonymous email address. And we have a guide on our blog on how to do this so that we can never really connect your personal identity to your CASA account. However, in order to make the CASA product and software have a really seamless user experience, we do know your balance, your transactions, because that's the only way we can actually show it in the app to you, right? And so a lot of people uh, don't realize this, but you even look at some of the hardware wallet providers like Trezor or Ledger, they've got their own software where you're kind of connecting in your hardware wallet. They can see your balance and your transactions too, because they need to be able to display it to you in the app. The only way you're actually going to get to something where nobody but you sees your Bitcoin balance and transactions is if you are running your own node and using a desktop app connected to that node that, or there could be some mobile apps that let you do this, but it's very hard to do. So usually it's a desktop app connected to that node where everything is fully self-hosted by you and the software uh, developers that created that desktop app don't have any sort of backend that runs, you know, like uh, some of the transaction services as like a fallback to your own node. So the level of um, effort that you have to go in, that you have to put in ramps up significantly if you want full privacy on your Bitcoin. And then you got to take into account the fact that you probably bought your Bitcoin on Coinbase. And so if somebody really wanted to trace what you were doing, they, they could. They just follow the transaction from Coinbase to your wallet and then see where it goes from there. So we think we've taken really a, a pretty practical approach here, which is you are able to make yourself pseudonymous from CASA's standpoint so that your personal identity is, is not really connected to your Bitcoin identity. But then you get all of the benefits of not having to run your own node and do everything from scratch yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's a learning process. And, you know, I mean, nobody, you know, I mean, most people are not like super paranoid, and super cautious, like James and Lop. <laughs> I mean, if anybody knows this story, it's, it's hilarious, like how he like, literally deleted every trace of his existence. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a mind blowing. It's like you know you could make a film movie out of it of this story. But yep. yeah, but it's a you know I mean you, unless of course you you do this from the beginning totally you know uh, uh, with non KYC bought you know Bitcoin running your own full node or buying whatever from maybe even from Atsteco you know like sort of uh, those yep. those redeemable lightning redeemable Bitcoin something like that so uh, there's yeah but but you know it's trial and error learning process so uh, yeah but but you know uh, you, you can improve your privacy this is what I'm tr you know, trying to say yeah and, I, and I'm not saying that um, trying to do everything self-hosted and be fully private is a bad thing uh, I'm just saying that Casa is building for a customer that values privacy and wants to get as far as they can, you know, without taking the extra step into self-hosting everything. And so we've tried to put as much privacy in um, guardrails into our business as possible to protect our customers' privacy. And there's a really large group, you know, base of people in the world to where they want what CASA is providing from that aspect because they don't have to do it all themselves. For the people that do it all themselves, that's awesome. And I, I love playing with some of that stuff myself too. And I hope that in the future, we'll be able to enable more of this, like using your own node with CASA, et cetera, so that we can start to help even more people do this easily. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, don't you find it fantastic? I mean, it's just fascinating how 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 fast the rate of speed or you know of development is in everywhere. You know, with its lightning, yeah. or, 
usability, UX, user interface, user experience, the ease of use as you, you know, as you already sort of explained now, you know, how Casa works. It's, it's amazing. Even Granny can now do this. I mean, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, um, I, the, the rate of development and evolution of things generally is amazing. And it's one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately about why Bitcoin as an open protocol and an open monetary system is so valuable. And it's because of its permissionless nature, right? Anybody can plug into Bitcoin and build on top of it without any permission from somebody else. And whenever you open something up to anybody in the world can build on uh, build on this, create value on top of this protocol, there is just huge potential there. And we've seen that play out with Bitcoin, but I think it's only going to grow as this gets more and more international and reaches more people around the world. And in order to keep that, you know, it's important for us to remember, like, what are the core properties of Bitcoin that allow us to keep that permissionless network nature? It's things like running your own node, like holding your own keys. That's why CASA is so focused on helping people hold their own keys. Because if you aren't holding your own keys, you give up the permissionless nature of Bitcoin. Suddenly you have to ask permission from Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini to move your Bitcoin instead of you just moving your Bitcoin whenever you want to. And so um, there are real benefits for having a international open permissionless monetary network. And um, that's why we're seeing such a explosion in development on top of that network. And I'm, I'm fully expecting that to continue and only accelerate over the next decade. Yeah, super exciting. Um, there were a couple of questions I popped on my head. Um, what about inheritance? Like, uh, do people like ask you guys or your team like, okay, you know, I've, I'm a, what if what something happens to me? What if I die? Like, yeah. how do people like resolve this? Like, uh, how what, what concerns do they have? Yeah. So this is one of the biggest problems that people have historically had when you're holding your own keys, right? Because if you think about the traditional banking system, if you um, pass away, you have a will set up, the bank and the courts and your estate process work through transfer of those assets to your heirs according to the will. Well, with Bitcoin, when you're holding your own keys, you run into this problem of there's no bank that is actually helping you to transfer these assets. And very frequently, the other people in your family or whoever you have left Bitcoin to in your will, if you have got taken that step, which a lot of people haven't, but assume you have, um, they don't know how to use private keys. They don't know how to use Bitcoin. And so for people who have material wealth stored in Bitcoin, this is a real problem. And they're worried about whether their family members are going to be able to access this after they pass away. So we saw this as a core problem of self-custody and we created a solution around it. And it really leans into the fact that you have multiple keys with Casa protecting your Bitcoin. So it means that you can, you can create your inheritance setup ahead of time in such a way that those keys are accessible by your heirs after you pass away. But you don't have to worry about them or somebody else, you know, accessing too many keys while you are still alive and being able to steal your Bitcoin because that's always the trade-off, right? It's like, how much information do you give while still keeping yourself protected against the problem of somebody finding the, that key and stealing all your money. So um, with the multi-sig, multiple key model, you can set it up and our client service team helps people with this. You set it up in a way that these keys are accessible only after you have provably passed away. And um, then a thing that is provides a ton of peace of mind for our customers is that our client service team is there to help the heirs actually access that Bitcoin, work through the transfer process, figure out how to store it after you know they don't have you helping them with it anymore. And that person, that helping hand there is really critical 
for the peace of mind of, of a lot of the families that are using CASA because they know that, okay, if I pass away and I'm the only one that knows how to use Bitcoin in my family, the CASA client advisors are there to help people in my stead. So currently this is available only at our um, diamond tier, which is the top tier of our plan. And we've actually gone through a ton of improvement on this product over the last couple of years. So we released it about two years ago. We've gone through three major iterations of this since then in order to make it work as seamlessly as possible for the customer and inside Casa. And then with the goal of being able to roll this out to more people at the other tiers of Casa in a more scalable way. So that is um, where we're at today with that product. And it's a really important part of our offering because like I said, this is one of the biggest problems that to date, what a lot of people do is they don't know how to solve it. And so they just try not to think about it and hope they don't get hit by a bus walking out the door tomorrow. But it's better to think about this now, set it up earlier to make sure that your family's in a good position should anything happen. Which uh, makes it advantages because uh, you don't need, you know you don't need to go through notary or lawyer or you know or set up even a will right I mean you can just set it up in a way that yeah you know gives you sort of yeah everybody like security or it gives you, so yeah um, and there's different so uh, just to clarify on that specific point are that um, different people want it set up differently yeah. so some people have you know, especially in the US, they've got a full trust set up for their Bitcoin. And this is a more tax advantaged way to pass down assets to other people. And in that scenario, you really, you want the lawyer, you want the will, you want the trust, like you want all that. And then there's other people who just want the, to set up the really simple angle, which is like, my heirs know how to access the keys should I pass away and cost the client service team is here to help them with that. And so we really serve this broad range of needs from that inheritance perspective. And that's important because different people want to approach this differently. Right. Um, so let me see if well, it was a question I just popped. I just forgot my, my um, so yeah, let's talk about, um, do you, from your perspective, do you see more people, um, you know, uh, demanding such a service um, because yeah, of so you know, different circumstances? And you know, we we talked we talked off record, you know, because I see a wave of people like you know wanting to emigrate like because of you know tyrannical uh, things going on and 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 crimes against humanity, mandatory vaccination, all this stuff. You know, even if even in Austria, so. Do you see like a trend like evolving? Yeah, so I definitely, we've seen a trend really since the start of COVID with more people thinking about inheritance. And I think it was because at the, at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, there's a lot of people worried, you know, we weren't sure how deadly this thing was. And so they were um, really wanting to like, put some things in place to make sure that should the worst case scenario happen, their family's taken care of. Um, and so we've continued to see people kind of thinking along those lines. I will say we've seen less from the, the case that you were talking about with inheritance specifically um, in terms of people immigrating to other countries. And that's because right now the inheritance offering that we have is only available to U.S. customers. So we're, we're working to roll that out to more countries, but there are laws that we as CASA, as an entity, have to follow to as part of the inheritance process to make sure that you know we're not breaking any country level laws. Um, so that's why we're available in the U.S. only today. And we don't really see a lot of that use case that you were just talking about. But one of the things that is really interesting with the immigration use case that you were talking about is a lot of times in the traditional banking system, this was immigrating from one country to another and bringing your money. With. Okay. So in the traditional banking system, when people immigrate from one country to another, setting up a bank account, transferring funds, that's a huge pain. Well, with Bitcoin, 
and self-custody, you are the bank. So you can put your Bitcoin in a self-custody wallet, emigrate wherever you want, and you still have your money with you, which is pretty amazing, right? It's, it's that's a, really amazing. Yeah, that's, It's a complete change in how this, this total works. Total self-sovereignty. This is what I call total right. self-sovereignty. Yeah, amazing. Right. And so you, it just unlocks so much for people. Like how many people in the world um, have had trouble with moving to a new country and accessing the banking system and having that be reliable? Now that's completely solved. Yeah. Um, Nick, is it possible to, I'm not up to date, uh, is it possible to time lock? Like, let's say you want to have a substantial portion of your funds like time locked for whatever, so many years. Is that possible? So we don't do that today. Um, and the reason that we don't do that is because typically time locks require a um, additional amount of info that you need to back up. So it adds, you know, instead of just having the typical public private key information to recreate your wallet, you would need an additional amount of info, which basically says, here's how long this time this time lock was for. Here's the block number when this time lock was going to expire. And then there's probably some other pieces of info. That's an oversimplification. Simplification. Um, and so that adds some complexity into it that we just haven't wanted to put onto our users yet. And it's something that really is more of an advanced user feature that you know the Casa customer base isn't really looking for today, I would say. So that's that's the approach that we've taken. Maybe we will add something around that in the future, but we can't do that today. Great, great. All right, uh, Nick. Yeah, I mean, I'm out of question. Are there any like, is there any like essential information people should know? Like, or w w what's your perspective? Uh, you know, in general, like, w how do you how do you see things evolving? That would be like from your personal. That would be really. I'm really curious. Like, but w how do you see things evolving right now? Like, if you zoom out a little bit, geopolitical, macro, uh, economically, structurally, um, or when it comes to I don't know to <laughs> regaining our freedom. Um, how do you see things evolving? Well, I think, you know, zooming out to what's going on with the whole world right now is like another two hours of conversation, probably. So I'll keep us zoomed in on what's going to, what's happening with Bitcoin from a more very like high level kind of systemic and broad based view. And I'll give it this angle of how are people storing Bitcoin? So like I said earlier, self-custody of Bitcoin is a critical part of, it's a critical benefit of the Bitcoin network, but it's also critical to the systemic security of the network. So when you have a lot of different people self-custodying a lot of Bitcoin, that gives a uh, the network an additional layer of robustness in terms of having that Bitcoin be protected. Whereas if everybody's keeping their Bitcoin in a few exchanges held by a few custodians, that puts the Bitcoin network itself at risk because somebody, a bad actor, or even just making a mistake could freeze all of that Bitcoin cause it to be handed over to a government or something or, you know, steal it. And so in that scenario, if 50% of the Bitcoin networks, like the actual Bitcoin in the world were to suddenly be seized, what does that do to the usability of Bitcoin overall as a currency? I think it's harmful. And so today there's estimates that say, legitimately up to 60% potentially of all outstanding Bitcoin is held by a custodian. So one wow. of the things that, that really 60%, that's, that's yeah, a lot. 60%. That was an, um, an estimate by Chainalysis mm -hmm. who, you know, they've got insight into what all the custodians are doing, what all the wallets are doing, you know, they're kind of the evil overlords of blockchain analysis, <laughs> right? But they have a pretty good view of what's going on. Right. And they put out a blog post that was actually, you know, the analysis was done a couple of years ago. So um, I, but I don't think based on the data that it's gotten much better uh -huh. that about 60% of 
total Bitcoin that isn't lost is um, held by custodians today. So when I zoom out, I think that's a risk to the network. And I've been telling people this for a while now, and this is why it's a big part of Casa's mission, is we have to get as many people as possible self-custodying their Bitcoin because it is critical for the health of Bitcoin, but also for the people who are holding it because it just gives them so much more security, sovereignty, and the the freedom that Bitcoin offers. You only get that when you are holding your own keys. So helping people to get started with that is critical, helping them move off of exchanges, start holding their own keys. And Casa is a great place to do that because we have solutions for all different levels of holdings. And we've tried to make it super simple for people to do no matter where you are. So um, that is, I think, the big picture trend that I'm really focused on today yeah. and that I think is important for us to be valid talking point. about. Yeah, definitely valid point. Now, folks, if anybody's listening out there, noobs, uh, get your Bitcoin off the exchange. It's just, it's just, it's just stupid. It's just really, it, I mean, with all the, you know, potential threats of whatever that is, you know, taxation, seizure, confiscation, you don't know what the state is going to do next or the company going to bu go bust, you know, not your keys, no coins, as Andreas Antonopoulos, I think, so many years ago, uh, you know, hammered it into the brains of the, tried to hammer this into the brains of the right. people. So, uh, yeah, to wrap this up, and make, I mean, any other, Essential, I think you've already said it, but but any other essential information advice you want to give people? I think it's this is, this is like overdue, super overdue. People need to get their their Bitcoin off the exchange. It's just it's just reckless. It's just irresponsible, and you know it's just sad. It it would be just sad if they, you know, people just lost, you know, for whatever reason. You know, I mean, we know we know so so many cases. You know, uh, how many exchanges have been. You know, hacked or or, or or go or went bust or whatever. So yeah, right. that, that's how what why Casa. I think this is the philosophy of Casa, right? So right, yep. And so I I think there isn't really much. I mean, there's a lot more that we could talk about, but I think from an overall view, that's really where I I think it's good to leave it and um, just know that it may seem intimidating at first, but there's companies like Casa that are working hard to make this simple. And so um, it doesn't take as long as people think. They think they're going to be spending multiple days setting this kind of thing up. And that's just not the case. Like we've made it super easy so that people can get set up literally in minutes with holding their own keys. And that's um, it's important because you don't want this to be something that's on your rainy day list forever, right? It doesn't take as long as you think and it's easier than you think to actually get done. So do it for yourself and for the health of the network. Great, yeah. Just final question, maybe I forgot to ask. Uh, so you've got like, you know, individuals, but do you also have like a, do you have like a bunch of companies, institutions doing this multi-sig with Casa? Yeah, we definitely have some. So we don't have, I wouldn't say it's a ton, uh -huh. but we have some that hold their Bitcoin using Casa. And um, the reason for that is really just it, they want that additional layer of systemic risk protection that you don't get when you're using a custodian. And um, so, yeah, we do have companies that use Casa today. They're the larger ones, you know, like you're thinking about, if you're thinking about like micro strategy, those kind of guys, they actually have some requirements from a f legal requirements from like a fiduciary duty perspective to where they typically need to use a custodian, which is why when you're looking at smaller, smaller companies that don't have those legal requirements just because of their size, or you're looking at individuals who don't have these legal requirements because they're not managing money on behalf of shareholders, mm -hmm. you know, these people who can choose to self custody, it's critical that they do because there's already going to be some amount of the market where legally they're required to use a custodian. Yeah. Let's get the rest of the market that can self custody to be able to do that. Makes sense. Yeah. So, hey, Nick, uh, really pleasure talking to you. Uh, really informative. Uh, any informational resources or links uh, you want to direct my listeners to? Or what yeah, people find yeah, it? that'd be great. So our website is keys.casa. That's K E Y S dot C A S A. And that has a ton of resources on our um, website, on our blog. You can download the product. There's resources in, in the product that walks you through everything you need in order to get set up holding your own keys. Um, 
So that's the first place that I would go. Second, our Twitter is at Casa Hodl, C-A-S-A-H-O-D-L. And we put out a lot of good info on there. And then my Twitter is at N Newman, N-N-E-U-M-A-N. And so all three of those are, are places to follow for information about, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin security, self-custody, etc. You can learn a lot. Great. I'm going to put this all in the show notes. So Nick, uh, thanks so much again. And uh, yeah, hope we can repeat this maybe in the new future. All right. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right. Um, if you haven't uh, taken off, you know, taking off the your Bitcoin from exchanges, do it now. And um, and by the way, if you have, if you don't have a hardware wallet, uh, if you're a total new noob, uh, beginner, and you should definitely, you know, not your keys, not your coins, withdraw your Bitcoin instantly to your hardware wallet. Get your hardware wallet. I put all the, you know, discount co codes uh, for, you know, for example, con uh, cold card from Conkite. Uh, Keystone uh, and Bitbox um, in the in my show notes. Uh, there's a discount code uh, Davani. You just use Davani as a discount code. And yeah, follow me on Twitter. Follow uh, Nick Newman on Twitter. And uh, yeah, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, the podcast platforms. And let me know any suggestions uh, for any you know, future potential interviews or you know experts, whistleblowers, insiders, <laughs> technologists. Uh, uh, if you want to, you know, uh, have me interview them on my show. And thanks so much again for uh, listening, for your loyalty. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I'm the Kevin Davani, the host of the Kevin Davani Connection Show.